Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I am delighted to welcome you to the grand opening of the 2018 Horasis Global Meeting in this wonderful city of Kashkais. The theme of the meeting is inspiring our future. We are facing a world what is increasingly, which are facing a world that is increasingly complex and ultimately out of balance and out of order. We are witnessing several crises in the world. A geopolitical conflict in the Middle East, the rise of populism in the Western world, and the demise of globalization wherever we look. We are asking what kind of governance, what models of governance do we need to support an equitable future? How to develop a global order that will ensure peace? And how to stay true to our core values as we work to build a more focused life for ourselves and our societies? Ladies and gentlemen, with this Horasis Global Meeting, we want to inspire the future and would like to shape the future. We want to make a case for strategic foresight and long-term oriented planning and acting. The world is too much bound by short-termism and tit-for-tat strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, let's jointly inspire the future. I'm joined this morning by a very powerful panel and uh, would like to introduce the panel to you in a second. Uh, Minister Maria Manuel Letao Marques, who is a minister of the presidency and also in charge of administrative modernization here in Portugal, who will speak on behalf of the Portuguese government. Carlos Moedas, the commissioner uh, of, in charge of research, science, innovation, coming from Brussels with the European Commission. Mr. Commissioner, you're here the second time and welcome again to Kashkais. And Dr. Mohamed El Baradé, who was the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna and who received the Nobel Award for Peace um, in 2005 together with the agency. He has also been a Vice President uh, of Egypt in 2013. Let me first call on you, Madam Minister, for your insights and of course welcoming everybody on behalf of the Portuguese government. Madam Minister. Dear Miguel Pinto da Luz, um, the owner of the place. <laughs> Dear Mr. Richard, thank you for inviting me and inviting the Portuguese government and thank you to choose our country to organize this conference. Dear Commission, Carlos Moedas. Dear Mr. Aberde, it's an honor to receive you in Portugal, I think for the first time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the headline threat, Portugal faces a political crisis. Portugal is the new Greece. This was the beginning of a conversation in late 2015. A new political solution was built and was putting forward different policies focused on promoting jobs and economic growth as a condition to comply with our European and international commitments. In the first half of 2016, the debate was red hot, and some politicians were trying to make this conversation darker, and some even called in the devil, but he hasn't appeared yet. This state budget has no economic or financial strategy, they said. It's unrealistic and populist, they said. They even came up with a derogatory name, Geringonça. This means something like contraption, but like the Portuguese word saudade, the translation is not able to convey the full meaning. Geringonça is something like this, <laughs> was supposed to be a bad world, something that was frail, complicated, 
Something that wouldn't work. Something that was all talk, no action. But when the results started to come in, the world gained a new meaning. When in 2006, the unreal and mathematically impossible deficit goal became a very real 2.3%, the world was no longer a bad one at all. So, Geringonza made a name for itself. It was even the world of the year in 2016. A new hopeful conversation had started as our Prime Minister said, it's a Giringonza, but a Giringonza that works. Last year, investment grew 9.1% and the economy grew 2.7%. These are very positive growth numbers, per se. But what makes them even better is that we made sure the growth was inclusive and was directed towards development. In 2017, the unemployment rate was below 80%, now 70.2%. And over the last two years, family income has increased. The equality is now less pronounced, and we have reduced the number of people below the poverty line by 80,000. These results have not ignored our public finances. The public deficit has fallen by 0.9% of GDP, and public debt saw the greatest drop in the last 20 years. And last year, we left the excessive deficit procedure in the European semester framework. So, we have guaranteed inclusive growth while pursuing sustainable consolidation of our public finances. The results were in. We were no longer all talk, no action. We were all action. But talking is not the opposite of doing. Actually, talking is action. In fact, we were all talk and all action. But can we now rest on our laurels? This is the important question. Has the conversation ended? Well, if we want to continue on this path of economic growth with better jobs and smaller inequality gap, of course not. We have to keep on talking and doing. We are engaging in a number of conversations at the same time. We are talking with our citizens first, our companies, our entrepreneurs, our public administration, our public servants, our academia, our research, very important, with Europe, European Union, that where we became part, with the world, very important, with all of you, here today. To ensure that we keep following this path, our growth has to be sustainable and resilient to economic cycles. We know they exist and unexpected accidents. We must look after our present, present, but also we need to invest in our future. This investment means a lot of different actions, from circular economy to public infrastructures. However, I would like to highlight today innovation and qualification of our human resources in both the private and public sector, which are the key to resilience. In order to innovate, we need to invest in research. And that is why we have set a target of allocating at least 3% of our GDP to research and development in 2030. But we have to make sure this investment 
really feeds into the economy. So we have created the interface program. Its goal is simple, to create an active partnership between research centers and companies through collabs. And this partnership needs to go from the design to the production phases. One could say, all talk, all action. And if conversations are the way to go to lead our private sector into innovation, they are surely the way to do it in the public sector as well. It's my job. We need innovation to be part of our public administration DNA. So since 2015, we've, sta we've started Simplex, our flagship program, to reduce administrative bureaucracy and develop new services, namely using ICT, to save time and money to citizens and to companies. A study by a Portuguese university revealed that just 13 measures of from Simplex 2016 saved companies about 624 million and saved the public administration almost half a million hours over a year. Perhaps one of the most important impacts of the Simplex programs is that it has been creating a new culture of participation, co-creation, and innovation in public administration. In order to know which areas or action to tackle first, we organized the Simplex tour around the country and Simplex Sham to hear citizens, companies, and uh, ser public servants. I ask the floor. It's what is right here. One could say, all talk, all action. But we didn't end the conversation there. We also create LabEx, our public sector experimentation laboratory, a place to safely experiment and prototype new solutions. Step by step, we are trying to build a public sector innovation ecosystem. And so in order to fall behind, not to fall behind, we have to stay at the forefront and find a path to adopt new disruptive technologies, such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, and data analytics. The goal is to better inform our public policies and decision-making processes and to change from a reactive paradigm to an anticipatory one. Some of these projects are already underway to predict, for instance, long-term unemployment, to detect abnormal patterns of antibiotics prescription, or to support the selection of economic agents for target food security inspection. One could say again, all talk. All action. Last but not least, we, un we want to raise the bar of these conversations to make them more challenging, more up-to-date, more educated, and more creative. And to do so, we have to invest in people and their qualification, including adult people, as a key factor for innovation in both the public and private sector countries are going to compete for qualified people in the near future. Hence, so we have started, for instance, a very ambitious digital skills initiative, namely INCODE 2030, with actions that range from inclusion, digital inclusion, and continuous learning to high-level research projects. Let me conclude. These are just some examples of the conversations and actions we are engaging in. A lot more could have been said, but in a conversation, you can always say something. For all of this, for all the talking and all the doing, for the conversation that we've had, but special for the ones yet to come, that's why I'm here today. 
to start another conversation that will lead to many more. I hope you have many fruitful conversations during the next few days. And who knows, looking back at this Oasis Global Meeting, one might just say, it was all talk, all action. Thank you for your attention. Portugal is very good news, and what you're doing at the government is, is very good news. And as I said, you know, we have to turn the action, uh, we have to turn the dialogue into action. I would like now to call on Commissioner Moedas, and before I would like to announce that um, Miguel Pinteluz, the Vice Mayor of Cascais, will speak at the end and summarize the discussion, of course, welcoming everybody on behalf of the city of Cascais. But first, uh, Commissioner Moedas. Good morning, everybody, and uh, I'm so sorry, it's so sunny outside and you are inside. You must be feeling really so sorry for you. Dear Frank, thank you so much. Always great to see you. Um, dear former Vice President El Baradei, thank you for coming to Portugal. My dear friend, Minister uh, Maria uh, Manuel Leto Marx, and dear uh, Deputy Mayor uh, uh, Miguel Pintelux. Uh, I'm really happy to be here on a second year uh, in a row. Uh, your meeting is one of these, that you have the talk, but you also have the action, as the minister was saying. Um, we talk about ideas, but you also talk about how to implement those ideas. And I think that the title, the theme for this year of inspiring our future is so important. Because, you know, we have really one big problem at the moment, is that today we don't find that inspiration for the future. Two years ago, I was at the Hanover Fair, and President Obama came, and he talked so well about Europe. And at some point in his speech, he said, you know, if you could choose a moment in history, a moment in history to be born, and you could pick from any moment in human history, that moment would be now. And people in the room were puzzled. Um, some people looked and said, what is he talking about? You know, and when you think about it, it's this disconnection between perception and reality. We talk, and I think it was Hans Rosling that used to say that humans naturally lean towards the dramatic. Sometimes we believe that there are things that we think are not true, but they are true, and sometimes we want to build evidence about our beliefs to be true even when they're not true. And so, the question is, do we have major challenges? We have huge challenges. I mean, we have gone in Europe through the biggest, biggest crisis since the Second World War. You name it, from the financial crisis that started in 2008, to the refugee crisis, to terrorism, to Brexit, and all those crises at the same time. But it's interesting that today, when I go to conferences, and I tell people, you know, Today, we have the lowest unemployment rate in Europe for the last 10 years. Or that we are creating the biggest amount of number of jobs for the last 20 years. Or that we are growing more than ever in the last 10 years. People are puzzled. People say, no, it's not possible because I'm not feeling it yet. I don't feel that. I don't relate to that. That inspiration about looking to the big picture, looking about our life and looking at about the last 100 years. That's where the disconnection starts. To tell people that 100 years ago we had 30 years life expectancy and that today one third of you will leave, I hope, more than 100 years old. Uh, or looking at people and saying, you know, like 100 years ago, 15% of the population would die from war, from uh, violence, and today it's probably six, eight people out of 100,000 people. And I think that we should get back to that, to tell people that what is the reality and what's the perception. The problem is that if we don't do that, we cannot inspire the future. And this disconnect between reality and perception happens so much times to me when I work in innovation and science. 
You know, my work is to look about, look and talk to innovators, to scientists, to see the great things that are transforming the world. But when I look at the media, when I talk to people on the street, what I hear is doubt and fear and disbelief and the perception that new technologies are taking over. Some people come to me and say, look, artificial intelligence, robots, machine learning, they will become uncomfortable. They will become just them. You know, I, I remember like two, three months ago, all over the news, there was the thing that were two computers, I think it was at Facebook, they started talking to each other and inventing a new language. And people believed that that was true. It was absolutely not true. But people were fearful of that. The idea that robots will take our jobs, that uh, will create mass unemployment. And that kinds of reaction, reaction are not based on evidence. They're based on fear. And if we want really to look into the future and explain people, I think we have to do three things. The first is to look into the past. The second is really to look into ourselves, and the third is to look beyond technology. You know, I was reading the other day about when they uh, launched the first railway in the UK in 1825, the Stockton-Darlington Railway. And people thought that that innovation of having the first steam locomotive would just be so bad for people. I mean, there's, it's written. The people would say that the human body would not be able to travel at a speed as high as 30 miles per hour. People generally believe that traveling at this speed they wrote would leave you disfigured. And some people even suggested that bodies would melt at 30 miles per hour. And Lao looks ridiculous, isn't it? But it's uh, really easy to explain when we know what was the reaction that was driven these statements. It was fear. And the fear for our jobs is also not new. I was in Germany the other day, and they were showing me three covers of Der Spiegel. One cover of the magazine in 1964, another one in 1978, and another cover from 2016. The title was the same. 50 years apart, the title was Computers and Robots Will Lead to Mass Unemployment. So it's like an apocalyptic future that has never come to pass. Yes, automation leads to really this unemployment that technology always led to, but also that technology leads to jobs that we don't even imagine. And there's those jobs that we don't even imagine today that we have to focus into the future. It's not about the jobs that will be destroyed. We know they will be destroyed. There are so many other jobs that will be created. You know, when uh, this year I was at uh, uh, the Davos conference, and uh, one of the studies there was that 65% of uh, primary school students getting today into primary school will work 65% in jobs and professions that do not exist yet. So the first thing is to look at artificial intelligence as a way to complement, to augment us, to help us to be better and to create those jobs. The second thing that puzzles me is when, let's look at ourselves, and people, I find so strange, you know, that uh, people are convinced that humans will become obsolete. For me, if you try to think about what makes us special, if you try to think about what's different from us in robots, you just don't want to compete with robots, Robots will always be better than me looking at numbers and associating numbers, but robots will not be as good as me in emotions, in linking and experiencing, in linking different parts of the world. Polanyi, the Hungarian-British polymath, once said that we know more than we can tell. And I think there's so much in this really short sense. We know more than we can tell. You know, we divided knowledge in two types, the one that we can digitize and the knowledge that we cannot digitize, the tacit knowledge. Why are we meeting here? Are we meeting here because we need this experience? If not, we will do it through Skype or teleconference, but we need this experience of being together. Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize, 
uh, in behavioral economics uh, 40 years later expressed the same idea than Polanyi. He said that we have two modes of thinking. One that is fast and automatic, and the second one that is conscious, that employs free will, agency, or experience. And that's our differentiation. The first is artificial intelligence, and the second is humanity. So if we can't articulate these experiences, how can we program artificial intelligence to be as efficient as us, or even better? So I think that we have to look into that and think what we will do in the future is a political choice for artificial intelligence. We want artificial intelligence to help us, not to replace us. And finally, I wanted just to ask you to look beyond technology. I think that we, uh, like me, I'm an engineer, so I love technology. We talk too much about technology, but sometimes we don't look beyond technology. And if you think about innovation, if you think about the effects of innovation, we sometimes are missing the point entirely. At the beginning of the 20th century, when electrification came, you know that people resisted, as they resist today, to artificial intelligence. Companies, at the time, would just say, why do I change my steam engine to an electrical motor? Why do I do that? If I have a big steam engine, I'll replace it by a big electric motor, and I'll just have a marginal gain. So it was not about technology, because the ones who did it had to redesign the whole shop floor. They had to redesign the process. They understood that the process that was designed was a process designed for a big steam engine. With electricity, you could have small motors around the shop floor. You could organize the architecture of the space. You had to think really beyond that. And so when you did it, the ones who did it understood that it was not longer determined by the steam engine what you were doing, it was determined by the people, by the workers. Factories could uh, get their goods out of the market far quicker than their rivals, not because of electricity, but because you all designed the process. Many of those who refused to understand that lost, and the ones who didn't won. So innovation, by its very nature, challenges the outlook we have on the world. And because of that, it's easy for us to perceive it as a threat. Ultimately, I think that we are not afraid of new technologies so much as we are afraid of the loss that will bring to us those new technologies, the loss to our lives, to the control of our lives, to the jobs. And the only way we can mitigate that is to bring people on board, involve those that fear new technologies, those who will be most affected by them in the design process, make it user-driven, intuitive for us and for others, help us to understand, put the people at the center and not the technology. Socrates, the philosopher, was famous by never writing his ideas of the great philosophies that he did. He said that the invention of writing would produce forgetfulness and only a semblance of wisdom, but not truth or real judgment. And when his student Plato wrote down those words on a scroll, he agreed and said that writing was a step backwards for the truth. How ironic it is that in reality, the innovation of the written word is exactly what immortalized both of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos. Thanks so much, Commissioner Moedas. I think you put it uh, right. We have to overcome the fear of technology and saying we have to, to use AI, we have to use technology uh, to augment our own perceptions and our own will to transform the world, but we have to go beyond technology as well. Let me now call on Dr. El Baradé. Well, Madam Minister, Commissioner, Deputy Mayor, Dr. Rector D. Frank, My, the theme of this meeting, a congregation of brain power and experience, is how to ensure 
that our future will be peaceful and stable, and how to inspire and be inspired by young people in the process. My starting point, and I will take a rather overview of where we are, is to acknowledge upfront that there is a good deal of angst and uncertainty as to the direction our future will take. And to recognize the palpable disconnect between us, the mature generation, and those who have their future ahead of them. I'm not in the least trying to ignore or belittle our recent incredible achievement in understanding our world and ourselves, nor our unbelievable advances in fields like science, health, communication, etc. I'm like you, equally amazed by these advances, which turned someone like me in a space of less than two decades in almost a dinosaur, trying desperately to grasp the onslaught of technology around me, for which thankfully I have my son to help me make sense of it all. What I'm trying to convey to you here is the widening gap between our paradoxical nature as human, our ability to soar very high in pursuit of noble values and public good, but at the same time, our capacity to think very low without shame or remorse. This duality of good and evil, so-called, expressed in Zoroastrianism and almost every other face is neither novel or unfamiliar. But the gulf between the two is widening. This is my, maybe because our capacity to do both good and evil is amplified almost by the day. For while we are mo almost playing God in many fields like medicine and artificial intelligence, we are playing Satan in several others by expanding our ability to destroy our planet many times over in a blink of an eye. It is my strong belief that the root of all the so-called evils that permeate our human conditions in all fields is inequality, rooted in a clashes of values that transcend policy differences and go to the heart of rights and freedoms, social justice, rule of law, and what have you. When we hear President Trump saying that torture works, advocating a Muslim ban. When we see Mr. Kaczynski of Poland saying that refugees from the Middle East would bring disease and parasites to Europe. When we listen to President Duterte of the Philippines declaring a nationwide state of lawlessness, we appreciate the dimension of the crisis we are confronting. To me, it is a frontal attack on some of our basic values, budding confrontation between a world based on equity, inclusiveness, and rule of law, and a world based on discrimination, segregation, and extrajudicial norms. Last month, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, declared that, quote, the Cold War is back with a vengeance, but with a difference. The mechanism and the safeguards to manage the risk of escalation that existed in the past no longer seem to be present. This is extremely scary. He added that the risk we are facing today is that, quote, things spiral out of control. In 1956, 52, sorry, the great American statesman Edley Stevenson declared that, quote, the great enemies of man are war, 
poverty and tyranny and their assault on human dignity, which are the most grievous consequences of each. Today, sadly, seven decades after Stevenson's words, these enemies remain just as powerful. War continue to dominate the human timeline. We organize ourselves over the millennia into city-state, empires, sovereign states. We had the Peace of Westphalia, Congress of Vienna, League of Nations, United Nations, to regulate international relations. We had security systems based on balance of power, collective security, but force and violence continue to be our preferred choice to settle differences. What is dreadfully disturbing is that our response to loss of life has become mostly driven by geostrategic interest. The bottom line, who is dying and where? We wrung our hands while millions were slaughtered in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, where I just came back from, Darfur, Afghanistan, and now Syria and many other places. Limitation on the use of force, we thought of the cornerstone of the UN Charter, is being steadily ignored in Iraq, Libya, Yemen, and recently Syria. You know, it's a free for all almost right now. Humanitarian law is becoming almost a relic of the past. Use of chemical, we just saw, attacking hospitals and civilians, etc. Responsibility to protect against war crimes and crime against humanity it is becoming almost a footnote of history. The International Criminal Court, which we were happy to have, has become a forum for the weak and defeated basically for Africa, to be blunt. Many people are facing threats of starvation and famine in East Africa and other regions, while the UN is literally begging for peanut money that is not coming. Poverty and hunger through having, having decreased in recent decades remain outrageous and excusable. Around 800 million people live in extreme poverty. Two billion people li live below the poverty level. One in nine goes to bed hungry across the world every night, even though we produce more than enough food to feed everyone. Inequality and indistribution of wealth is becoming offensive and obscene. Eight men not even single women. Eight men own more global wealth than the 3.6 billion people who are the poorest half of humanity and who own a mere 1% of the global wealth. 1%, half the, half the humanity owns 1%. Brutal repression to move to another issue is the hallmark of a third of the world nations. Tampli trampling human rights has become a spectator sport on the part of the international community, whose response is mostly limited to a apathetic expression of deep concern. The argument invariably made is that our choices are limited. We have to choose between the bad authoritarianism, and the worst, terrorism. But the, but the reality is that in the process, the credibility of democratic regimes has almost vanished in the eyes of those fighting for the human dignity. And we are left with no vision, no leadership, or role models. We need better options than Regime change, which we have seen in Iraq. Dumb sanctions, which we have seen in many places where 
the vulnerables are the ones who are hurt. Use of force, which we see now people talking about, or embracing dictators and arming them to the teeth. These are the options we are using. Our institutions, national and international, have become anachronistic. National governments are facing a crisis because of their inability to adjust to a globalized world. They are unable to meet the expectation of a growing and urbanized population for prosperity and fairness. There is a loss of trust in the political class, there's no question. In the power and influence of money, in the suitability of direct democracy to address complex issues, Brexit or a peace agreement in Colombia. Worse still, the structure and authority of the state as an organizing unit is now being questioned. While a large territorial grouping based on geographical proximity and an overarching culture such as the EU was seen as a model for the future, we now see increasing retrenchment, retrenchment toward the ethnic and the small. Catalonia and Scotland are recent examples. International institutions, on the other hand, suffer from structural deficiencies and lack of authority and resources. They were created for a completely different era and steadily becoming polarized and polarized. The recent performance of the Security Council, which I have, I'm sure all of you have seen in the case of Syria, is a star case in point. Noise about the need to reform the UN system has been with us since the end of the Cold War, but it is now almost muted and nobody even taking it seriously. To add insult to injury, and a quarter of a century after the end of the Cold War, when we talked about a recent, a new world order, we still rely on nuclear weapons for our global security. We still have 15,000 nuclear weapons in existence, 2,000 of them on so-called prompt launch, which means you can, have, and you can have seven to eight minutes, the president of Russia or the US, to, report, to respond to a possible at a report of a nuclear attack which could be completely manipulated or a mistaken one. Seven to eight minutes, less than the time you have for a cup of, cup of coffee. This is a security system, in my view, which is based on an insane do doctrine, mutual assured destruction, that is totally irrelevant to extremists. What do they care about mutual assured destruction? is grounded on the premise that some, those who have nuclear weapons, like nine plus the alliances, are more equal than others. They can rely on nuclear weapons, but nobody else. And is naturally subject to the inevitable human fallibility and miscalculation. It is a glaringly dangerous system, unsustainable, and I would say naive. In this, I would say, bleak environment I just painted, is there anything we can do? Can we still dream of a peaceful and a stable world? Can we still inspire the younger generation? As depressing as our current situation is, to my view at least, I still believe that yes, we can. And we owe it to ourselves at least to try. It is comfortable to note that all the ills I mentioned are not beyond repair. Thanks to the human, financial, and technological resources at our disposal. The central issue to me is one of skewed values and blinkered mindset. Poverty, tyranny, and other forms of inequality are not genetic or endemic human features. They are the result of an environment we created and a mindset we cultivated. We can easily fix them if we set our minds to it and comprehend their, their evil nature 
and destructive impact. Think of slavery, which we accepted for millennia, of torture, of gender discrimination, and many other values and mindset that we are slowly managing to shed as inhumane and unjust. So the key is to embark on re-examination of our values in you. The current blitz on some of these I just mentioned is an opportunity for an overdue counterattack, not only to respond to this dangerous wave of prejudice, but also to revisit all of our values, reaffirming the good and challenging the bad and the ugly. <laughs> We need a new global paradigm <coughs> based on value that we offer reference but rarely honor, <coughs> human dignity. <coughs> human dignity and all its derivatives, sanctity of life, equality, inclusiveness, diversity, and solidarity, and not, thanks, and not double standard, polarization, and humiliation. We need to address global challenges through global responses based on public common good where human dignity comes first. There must be a zero tolerance for tyranny and there must be a new cooperative system of collective security that does not depend on nuclear weapons. We obviously need a fresh approach to our governance modalities and institutions, nationally and internationally, focusing on global economic and social growth through the creation of level playing fields and through making full use of science and technology. Democracy and freedom are the key to long-term stability. But democracy is not instant coffee. It is a set of values and culture that goes much beyond the ballot box. It is mainly about eliminating the barriers to free and fair political participation. It is about institutions, dialogue, compromise, tolerance, inclusiveness, and much more. My experience, to, to come to an end because of the time, tells me that young people understand and demonstrate the thinking I'm talking about instinctively. Their mindset and values are refreshingly different from ours. And they are making <coughs> their presence felt on social media and through events like the March of our for Our Lives Across the World. Their slogan is simple. We are the change. It is time to listen to them, share their wisdom, and do our best to empower them. They will inevitably ever overtake us soon. A few weeks ago, I took my seven-year-old granddaughter to the park in Vienna. As we were walking along, she didn't find one of my evasive responses very convincing. She then immediately stopped, looked at me in the eye, and said in an, in an irritated voice, I want an answer right now. I realized then, as we all should, that it is time to listen and move fast. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. El Baradi. What a powerful conclusion and uh, wonderful words. It said the world is um, quite gloomy, but you put a lot of hope into it. And of course, we have to listen to the young people. <laughs> now I would like to call on um, my friend Miguel, Miguel Pintaluz, the vice mayor of Kashkais. Thank you very much. Two brief notes, just to say that I will use a Kindle, already a sign of digital disruption that we are living. I hope technology will cope 
with this challenge. And the second note is that when you put three politicians right in the podium, you have speeches, uh, long speeches. So I will try to be as brief as I can. Honorable Minister, European Commissioner, my dear friend Karl Moedas, Mr. Mohamed Helbaradei, my dear friend Frank Jürgen Richter, the real driving force of this community, Oasis. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, and a, spe a special mention to Deepak. Deepak is my personal friend, Indian friend, millionaire friend, astrologer, that two years ago in Oasis has predicted that I would be a father. And actually, nowadays, nowadays I've, I've a fa I'm a father of two beautiful twins, uh, uh, two ladies, Pilar and Rosarine, so thank you very much, Deepak, for that brilliant <laughs> prediction. Wonderful speech. I will start with a warm and heartfelt welcome once again to Kashkaish. Here we are, one year later, to inspire the future. Ever since King Luis I decided to step, set up his royal summer retreat on Portugal's coast in the late 19th century, Kashkaish has been transformed into one of the country's top desirable getaway destinations. But tourists and retirees from all over the world are not the only ones who flock to the inviting coastline just 20 miles west of the capital city of Lisbon. Over the last decade, the city of Kashkaish has added to its natural destination appeal lucrative business incentives which today make it a place where startups are prospering on the shores of the, of the Iberian Peninsula. Local and national government initiatives locally supporting entrepreneurship through accelerators, conferences, gathering business and political leaders from around the world, as this one, and programs sponsored by the European Commission, such as the European Space Agency, all contribute to the success of Kashkais as a springboard of innovation nowadays. Add to that the recent government launched startup visa program to attract top international talent to the region, and you have a business-friendly environment that has opened its doors to innovation and to the rest of the world. The municipality of Kashkaz itself was recognized by the United Nations this year, just a couple of months ago, as the only local government body to win the prestigious World Summit Award, Award for Government and Citizen Engagement through its City Points app. Based on gamification and the engagement of citizens, the City Points app induces participants to take an active role in transforming the community. With one City Point at a time, participants improve their engagement in the sustainable city, and the rewards include perks such as free admissions to museums, guided tours, free workshops, ticket to events, and even minutes of parking for your cars. We do not need long speeches anymore. But today, we gather here about 600 people from all over 90 countries of all nationalities, races, creeds, reflecting the world as it is to debate how we can influence what the world we live in is to become. And this opening ceremony is simply to show you that we are in the exactly the right place to be having this debate, a debate punctuated by major issues. First, the world is changing faster than ever. And it is unclear whether, whether modern democracy will be able to keep up with the changes. Allow me to quote A.J.P. Taylor, Alan Taylor, nothing is inevitable until it happens. And predicting democracy future is no exception to this sentence. In a world where the IT revolution is having profound effects on the economy, society, and of course politics, both positive and negative, where inequality in the develop, underdeveloped world is on the rise, but where millions in the underdeveloping world are emerging from poverty nowadays, where fundamentalism appears to be on the rise, but where in other regions there is also an increase in non-ideological approaches, and where over half the world's population is urban. In fact, today's urban populations are expanding and growing in a density at a pace that is difficult for many existing cities to match. It is hard to say what opportunity democracy will have, what threats there are, and whether its response will be effective. Will the connection between the freedom and equality hold, or will it be broken, or will their relationship change under the pressure 
of new circumstances? Will democracy as we know it, an hybrid of government by elected officials and the free market economy, nowadays, as we know, much more tempered since the last crisis, the rule of law, of course, and the ever-increasing participative democracy still survive in a recognizable form. Second, I'm not one to believe in the we are doomed syndrome, as recently declared by the social scientist Meyer Hillman in The Guardian, in the pages of The Guardian. The adoption of concrete measures to combat climate change and guarantee the sustainability of our, of our planet. We must be fully aware that the challenge of this magnitude, as is that of climate change, cannot be solved by cities working in isolation or by countries standing alone, and that in light of the position of the United States of America. Perhaps, my dear friend Carlos Moedas, only the European Union united can lead a concerted initiative at the world level towards the enforcement of the Paris Agreement. I absolutely think that it's vital in the response to the climate change which threatens the entire existence of humanity. Third, artificial intelligence, intelligence has the potential for dramatic disruption of everything from manufacturing to education and health. Its future applications are limitless and the full impact yet unknown. We are too early in its evolution to know how far it could replicate and exceed the human brain's capabilities. Predictions vary as to how many jobs could be replaced or created by AI. And CSIS technologies, of course, I'm talking about blockchain, big data, hyperconnectivity, and Internet of Things. Fourth, as regards jobs and talking about jobs, we have growing concerns about ownership of critical future technology. Will a few powerful investors and big corporations dictate the life on Earth? They could develop or acquire the core technologies and applications that underpin every business activity, government decision, social interaction, and financial exchanges. Fifth, no one can predict how many jobs Automation, automation will displace over the next decade. But we can make reasonable assumptions that large number of tasks will be automated, even in professions such as medicine, law, and finance. Will safer autonomous vehicles, for example, mean the end for car mechanics and car insurance? And would these businesses reinvent themselves and create new roles? Of course, I can see it these and many others as examples. At least six conventional industries that I know have been completely disrupted by digital innovation in the past two decades. Music, first, video renting, books, taxis, newspapers, retail. In financial terms, the survivors are shadows of their former selves. The world of work is in a state of flux, which is causing considerable anxiety and of course, with good reasons. Six, startups have democratized access to information, empowered individuals, brought people together and reduced prices for many services, from email to photo storage, often to zero. They embodied what seemed to be an unstoppable, unstoppable historical wave of progress, hailed as technologies of freedom, as I, th I feel the solar pole call it in 1983. But tech giants nowadays are attacked by enabling non-stop surveillance by advertisers and governments, undermining democracy by spreading fake news and failing to do enough to combat a variety of causes. They stand accused of failing to take their responsibilities to take soci to society sufficiently seriously, lacking transparency and accountability while also avoiding taxes. And they have such dominion that we must seriously talk about regulation. Governments must step in to protect consumers or to ensure a competitive environment. Opponents of regulation argue that tech giant supremacy is more fragile than it seems. Nobody is forced to use Google, which overthrew the previous champion of web search, AltaVista, that I used to use. Similarly, Facebook toppled MySpace and now provides valuable services completely free for more than 2 billion users. 
Where is the evidence of consumer harm? Finding the right answers to these questions is essential for the health of democratic institutions, the integrity of the public sphere, and more important, the protection of personal privacy. And last but not least, the seventh, there are many more 70 somethings than there used to be. In America, for example, today a 70-year-old man has a 2% chance of dying within a year. In 1940, this milestone was passed at 56. In 1950, just 5% of the world's population was over 65. In 2015, the share was 8%, and by 2050, the expected, the, uh, it, it is expected to rise to 16%. Rich countries are graying more than the develop, underdeveloping world, except for China, of course, which is already well on the getting old process. The share of the over 65 in the OECD countries is set to increase from 16% in 2015 to 25% in 2050, a quarter of the population. Example, an example, Britain, which had just 24 centenarians in 1917, people with more than 100 years old, now has nearly 15,000 people with more than 100 years old. But be aware that many of those older people today are not, in, the, in fact, old, in the sense of being worn out, sick, or inactive. <clears throat> when Otto von Bismarck brought in the first formal pensions in 1880s, pay, payable from the age of 70, right after changed and reduced to 65, as you know from history, life expectancy in Prussia was 45 years then. Today, in the rich world, 90% of the population lives to celebrate their 65th anniversary, mostly in good health, yet that date is still seen as the starting point of the old age nowadays. These new young old are in relative good health. They want financial security, but they are after something more flexible than the traditional retirement products are on offer. They will remain productive for longer, not just because they need to, but because they want to, and more important, because they can. And they can add great economic value, both as workers and as consumers. As defined, pension schemes become a thing of the past, and we have to update them in line with today's realities. And the increasingly clever technology will help us make the most of the final stage of our lives, enabling us to wage at home and retain as much autonomy as possible. It is not that it may change, it will actually change, one way or another. And there will be winners and losers, as in everything in life. Our role in this room, our role outside this room, is to ensure that there are increasingly less losers, and whoever they are, and they will always exist, and one day could be us, they will never be totally marginalized. As for myself, I continue to believe in a classical liberal values, a belief in the human progress, distrust of powerful interests, and respect for individual freedom. For this reason, I tr truly believe that we must endeavor to take full advantage of all change and disruption to make our lives better, to make a better world. Despite all the problems we have, it has mostly always been this way throughout history. And now it is our turn to take the initiative and continue forward and build a real better world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Miguel Pinteluz. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Alvedea, Madam Minister, Commissioner Moedas. I think we feel a lot of optimism here in the room. We can really go ahead. We can shape the world, inspire the world. And now we have to move the dialogue to action. Uh, now lunch is waiting upstairs and join us again after lunch, of course. But there's a big applause for the whole wonderful speeches, interventions and our good friends. Thank you. <laughs>